Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for depending on where you are in the world. Um, seems like Professor uh, Vagaman's ready for his uh, first lecture of this series on Leibniz algebra. Um, so please, uh, please go on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let me thank the organizers for inviting me and uh, please feel free to ask questions anytime. Yeah, interrupt me with your questions. Um, so I, I'm going to give the talk in the same style as uh, Professor De Kimpe and uh, on the blackboard. And uh, please note that there are lecture notes already available on, on the website. So you, you can read about this uh, in these lecture notes. Um, and please tell me also if um, I'm not writing big enough or something, if you can see the blackboard, I can maybe arrange things. Okay, um, I want to talk about, uh, on the one hand, uh, Leibniz cohomology in general, and in order to, uh, to understand what Leibniz cohomology is, we will also talk about the cohomology of Lie algebras. So this will be some part in these lectures, which uh, it, uh, is addressed to the biggest number of, uh, of people in the audience. And in the end of these lectures, I will come to a result, uh, which I proved together with uh, Jörg Feldfuss from, from the University of South Alabama. Uh, on the vanishing of the cohomology of uh, semi-simple Leibniz algebras. Okay, then let's start. Uh, motivation. Uh, algebraic structures come with a cohomology theory. Yeah, very naturally, uh, all algebraic structures come with a homology theory and a cohomology theory. But um, in these lectures, we will only talk about cohomology and not homology. And these uh, cohomology groups tell you something about the structure. Uh, of uh, the algebra in question or about uh, their representations. And so um, it is an important tool to compute these cohomology spaces. Yeah. So this is uh, what uh, the question I, uh, I'm concerned with. And so what are Leibniz algebras? Uh, you heard about many uh, types of non-associative algebras in, in this uh, summer school. So Leibniz algebras are one of uh, these classes of interesting uh, non-associative algebras. They are very closely related to Lie algebras. So this is why I'm going to talk uh, about both of those. Uh, and they can be traced back to block who invented them in, the, in 1965, but rather in a, in a way to, to generalize things from Lie algebras to, to something. And so they were rediscovered in the 1990s by Jean-Louis Laudet. Uh, but Laudet in, uh, did not invent them or reinvent them. Uh, just for the purpose of generalizing things, but uh, he um, had a very uh, precise goal in, uh, and his goal was to measure the non-periodicity of algebraic K theory. And so let me take uh, like five minutes to, to, to explain you this uh, context, uh, although it does not play any role in in our lectures, yeah. 
So first of all, what is a Leibniz algebra? Uh, uh, Leibniz algebra is a K vector space uh, with a bracket. linear bracket H cross H H such that on X Y Z in H we have X Y Z is equal to Z plus uh, Y yeah. So this is the Leibniz algebra identity, and uh, I write it in the left sense. Yeah. So this is the left Leibniz identity, and what does it mean? It means that um, It means that the bracketing with X is a derivation of the bracket. Yeah, and this bracketing with X in Lie algebra theory is always called at X. Yeah? So this is the way you read this equation bracketing with x is the derivation of the bracket of y and z yeah derivation in the least sense means you you apply it first in the first variable plus you apply it in the second variable okay then um so what about uh motivation periodicity in algebraic K theory. So what Lode um, and uh, you can read this in uh, in a, in the paper of Lode, which I put in the references uh, of these lecture notes, and uh, the paper is called. Um, oh, it's not in the references. Oh no, it's uh, in the ref. References of on the web page, yeah, on the web page there, are, there are some references. It's not in the references of the lecture notes, but the paper is uh, anyway called um, uh, algebraic K theory and the conjectural Leibniz K theory. Yeah. So um, uh, it is well known that K theory of a ring of a K algebra A is related to group homology. Yeah? In the sense that when you take homology of the group GLA, and this GLA is the group of uh, infinite matrices yeah? with values in the K algebra A. Yeah? So it's, it's the direct limit of G of all the GLN A. And this homology is related to uh, K theory. And in fact, it is uh, Hopf algebra uh, whose um, primitives are the K theory groups of A. Yeah? But the K theory groups uh, for rational coefficients. And so uh, this was well known, and uh, Lode compared it to Lode Quinnen Siegens theorem, which says when you take the same thing but for the Lie algebra of infinite matrices with values in A, also with values in Q, then this is also a Hopf algebra. Yeah? of algebra with primitives 
is equal to k. Yeah, I think you heard a little bit about Hopf algebra in, in Abdel Nasser Mahlouf's uh, talk. Yeah, so this is a graded Hopf algebra and primitives, graded primitives of the K theory. And here in the infinitesimal setting, there's also a Hopf algebra, and the primitives are the cyclic homology groups, cyclic homology. Yeah, and so this is kind of the group level, and this is the infinitesimal level. Yeah, and uh, so this is kind of the infinitesimal K theory, this cyclic homology. Yeah, and this is what um, uh, Feigen, Zigan, and Kohn discovered that there is some infinitesimal K theory. Yeah, and so for the infinitesimal K theory, it is rather easy to, to, uh, to, um, to understand the non-periodicity because there's Kohn discovered a long exact sequence, the Gaussian homology, cyclic homology, and then a periodicity operator going to cyclic homology two steps down and so on, yeah. And so, yeah, what I have to say also is why look for periodicity in K-theory? Topological K-theory is periodic, but this algebraic K-theory is not in general, yeah? And this is why it is interesting to, to capture the non-periodicity. So on the infinitesimal level, the non-periodicity is captured by this, these Hochschild homology spaces, yeah? And so this uh, actually, uh, there is, um, there is then, uh, a theorem of the same kind of Lode and Quillen uh, done by Cuvier and Lode, but for the Hochschild homology. And this goes with Leibniz homology, but of the Lie algebra, GLA. Yeah, this is also a Hopf algebra, but based on the tensor algebra, uh, where with the Hochschild homology groups. Yeah, and so the this uh, uh, factor which governs the non-periodicity of of um, infinitesimal Hochschild cyclic homology, uh, infinitesimal K theory, is related to the Leibniz. Uh, homology, yeah, and this this is how Lode came into considering Leibniz homology and Leibniz algebras. But actually, uh, he was only interested in the first at the first time by the Leibniz homology of Lie algebras yeah? and Leibniz cohomology of Lie algebras, not of Leibniz algebras themselves. Yeah, and so this is what <coughs> was computed in in the first. Uh, yeah, in the first couple of years. And so the, the end of the story uh, uh, is that therefore Lode conjectured that there, there must be some algebraic structure integrating Leibniz algebras and these he called coxibul. Integrating Leibniz algebras, integrating Leibniz algebras in the same sense as Lie groups integrate Lie algebras. Yeah, and so uh, when uh, when one knows what a Coxie is, then take the algebraic structure. This algebraic structure comes, as I said, with some cohomology, 
with some homology theory, and then apply this homology theory to the uh, K groups. Yeah, and this must then be um, this must be, then be the the right um, uh, cohomology theory with, which measures the default of periodicity in K theory. Okay, yeah, this is a bit complicated, and I, I will not uh, talk about these things in detail. Uh, okay. Any questions up to this point? So th this is more or less to say that I'm not going to talk about these things, which are uh, like a, a little bit advanced maybe. Okay, now let me come back to Leibniz algebra. Yeah? And uh, we talk here about left Leibniz and not right Leibniz algebra. Uh, you can imagine uh, when you look back at the identity which I wrote on the blackboard, uh, when you take the, the um, derivation property from the right hand side instead of taking it from the left hand side, yeah, then you get the right Leibniz identity and Lie algebras are on the same uh, footing, uh, are both right and left uh, Leibniz algebras. Yeah? Uh, but we will talk here only about left Leibniz algebra. In fact, the, the founding fathers of Leibniz theory, Bene uh, uh, Lode and Temuras Pirashvili, they were uh, only uh, thinking about right Leibniz algebra, and so many all of their articles are written in terms of right uh, Leibniz address. And sometimes you have to translate from left to right. And this is sometimes a little bit messy, but here I will only talk about left Leibniz algebra. So what is a morphism? A morphism of Leibniz algebra. Y from H to H prime is a linear map such that such that for all X and Y from H, we have bracket of phi of X phi of Y is equal to phi of the bracket of X and Y. Yeah, so it's like in Lie algebras. But uh, Leibniz algebra, the bracket in Leibniz algebra is not necessarily skew symmetric. That is the difference. And so, knowing that this is not necessarily skew symmetric, uh, there is um, a tool to measure the default of skew symmetry of the Leibniz bracket, and that is called the Leibniz kernel. Or the square, the uh, idea of squares. Yeah, and uh, as in Lie algebras, the, the notions of sub Leibniz algebra and ideal are exactly the same. Yeah, so uh, exactly as for the algebra. And so what is the idea of squares? It is the K vector space generated by expressions of the form X, X. Yeah, for X and H uh, and the K vector space generated by this. And this is called, this is denoted light of X. So um, actually, uh, 
Yeah, all the x, uh, all the expressions x y plus y x. Yeah, are in this idea because this is easily seen to be uh, x x. Uh, uh, this is x plus y. Y minus x x. Yeah. So this is all these expressions are in the Leibniz idea. Um. So, uh, and we have the canonical Lie algebra. Canonical Lie algebra associated. To uh, Leibniz algebra. This is called H Lie, which is uh, H divided by the square of ideals right, of H. Yeah. And so this is very clear that when you divide out all terms of the form xx yeah then what what remains is skew symmetric yeah and so uh so you there remains uh, a lie algebra yeah and this is the canonical quotient lie algebra. okay in order to see what this is all about let us um see some examples So the first example is the, yeah, first of all, uh, I already told you all Lie algebras are examples. Yeah, so you have a very large class of examples already. But uh, what about uh, Leibniz algebras, which are not Lie algebras? Yeah, so there is this n, yeah, k e plus k f as a k vector space. Which is so two dimensional as a k vector space. And what is the bracket? The bracket is uh, f f is e. Yeah? This is the only non-trivial bracket. Yeah, so this is kind of very interesting because it is uh, sort of uh, uh, non, uh, yeah, a Leibniz analog of the Heisenberg Lie algebra. Yeah, the Heisenberg Lie algebra is a um, one-dimensional central extension of the trivial Lie algebra in two dimensions. Yeah, and here we have a one-dimensional central extension. Yeah, because the E is central um, of a one dimensional vector space. Yeah, and not by a skew symmetric co cycle. Yeah, here, uh, this is not skew symmetric. This is, uh, in fact, the opposite. It is symmetric in F. Yeah, so uh, this is kind of uh, interesting to work with this Neil Potent uh, Leibniz algebra. Yeah, Neil Potent. Algebra. And in fact, uh, when I say Neil potent, I, I mean exactly as in the Lie sense. Yeah, uh, you know what uh, Neil potent Lie algebra is. Yeah, you, we just talked about Neil potent abelian solvable Lie algebras in, in uh, Karel uh, de Kimper's talk, and. Uh, so the same definition works here in Leibniz algebras, yeah, because taking this uh, iterated uh, bracketing, yeah, it makes perfectly sense for Leibniz algebras. Okay, so uh, here the Leibniz ideal of this n is everything generated by the squares. Yeah, what are the squares? Yeah, it's e. 
So this is the subspace generated by E and the um, quotient Lie algebra is N divided by uh, KE. So it's isomorphic to KF, yeah, one dimension. Uh, the second class of examples is what I, uh, what I call, according to Kenyon and Weinstein, semi, semi direct products. Yeah, when maybe I should look whether you have questions. No, there are no questions. Okay. So, uh, what is the matter here? Take the Lie algebra. And by the way, I will always call Lie algebras G and Leibniz algebras H. Yeah. Uh, at one place in my lectures, there will be a sub Lie algebra, which will be H. But, uh, my general notation is Lie algebras G, Leibniz algebras H. Yeah, so take a Lie algebra and a G module. What is a G module? It is a vector space M uh, such that uh, with an operation of G, I write everything from the left. So uh, an operation from the left of G on M. Uh, such that for all x, y in G and all m in M, we have x, y, m is x dot y dot m minus y dot x m. Yeah. So this is this operation from the left. And operating with the bracket is the same as operating first by y, then by x minus first by x, then by y. Yeah, this is kind of something maybe you know already. So take a Lie algebra and a G module M, then you can um, <clears throat> have the hemi semi direct product Leibniz algebra on the vector space G, uh, M plus G yeah. with bracket. Uh, M X M prime X prime is uh, X dot M prime X X prime. Yeah. So now you see why this is called the hemi semi direct product. Yeah. Uh, for the uh, semi direct product, there would be another term. There would be minus x prime dot m, yeah, but this is not here. So it's kind of half of the semi direct product. This is why Kenyon and Weinstein called it hemi semi direct product, yeah. And th this is also the effect why it is Leibniz and not Lee in general, yeah. Uh, if the module action is trivial, then it is a Lee algebra, yeah, for trivial reasons. But uh, if the action is non-trivial, then uh, it is not a Lie algebra. And for this example, we can compute the ideal of squares and the quotient Lie algebra. <clears throat> and so, for example, uh, computation What are the squares? The squares are elements of the form mx, mx. And this gives x dot m bracket x, x. But x is here in the Lie algebra, in the Lie algebra g. So this is 0. Yeah, so all, yeah, all elements or x dot 
m zero r squares. And so uh, this shows that life of H is in fact uh, G dot M. Yeah, this is the vector space spanned by these elements. And the quotient, yeah, here maybe I should say this H is here, the semi semi direct product of M and G. And so I put a cross and H as like hemi semi direct yeah and so the associated Lie algebra is uh, <clears throat> m divided by g dot m uh, plus uh, cross uh, g yeah and it, in fact this quotient Leibniz algebra is a Lie algebra. Yeah. Why, why is it a Lie algebra? Yeah. You give you one second to think about why it is a Lie algebra. Yeah. You see now here in this quotient, the, this term here, x dot m prime, is zero. Yeah. In the quotient, this term is zero. So it is just. Zero comma the Lie algebra, yeah, and so it is a Lie. Okay, then uh, so this is uh, one class of Leibniz algebra, which, uh, which will come up later, and let me also, yeah, I. You see here, I'm not giving uh, uh, the full account of all examples. Yeah, that this would be, uh, there, there are many, many examples. I will not be able to talk about many of them. I'm just taking some exemplified yeah, uh, classes of examples. So to have another exemplified class of examples, uh, I want to, uh, just mention that there's a link to differential geometry. And this is very important because uh, you all know that Lie algebras arrive, uh, arise in differential geometry, yeah, uh, as a tangent basis of, of uh, Lie groups as the unit element. And so the question is what do Leibniz algebras have to do with geometry? Yeah, and so uh, there are two very fundamental constructions which show that Leibniz algebras arise naturally in differential geometry. So one of them is the derived bracket formalism. Yeah, and if you want to read about this derived bracket formalism, I refer to Yvette Kuzman Schwarzbach. Maybe it's not her who invented it, but uh, it's, these are very nice papers on this subject. <clears throat> so take a differential graded Lie algebra. And then you can get out of it a new bracket just by taking the old bracket, but putting the differential in the first component. Yeah. If you take as a new bracket between X and Y in G, uh, the old bracket, but applied to dx and y, then this does not give, in general, a Lie algebra structure. But it is always canonical Lie, uh, Leibniz bracket. Yeah. So this is one source in differential geometry of, of, of um, 
of uh, Leibniz algebras. And another source is Courant algebra. And here also, I will not be able to talk in detail about Courant algebra. It, it is a kind of a subject in itself. It um, comes from Poisson geometry. And so what I just want to say is um, Courant algebra have uh, a bracket, yeah, which has uh, which can be expressed in, in two ways. Either you express it as a, um, as a bracket, which is skew symmetric, but does not satisfy some identity like Jacobi identity or, or Leibniz identity here. Yeah, this is one way to express it. And another way, so this is called usually the Kuchon bracket. And there's another way to express the same bracket. Um, and this is called the Dorfman bracket. And the Dorfman bracket it is uh, not skew symmetric, but it is Leibniz. Yeah? And so uh, it is a bracket on, let's say, vector fields on M plus differential forms on M, yeah? So the standard current algebra is modeled on vector fields of M plus different differential one forms on M. And the bracket is, so take a vector field plus a form and another vector field plus the one form. Then what you can do is the hemi semi direct product <coughs> and uh, together with uh, some other term. Oh, I'm sorry, the bracket of vector field plus the hemi semi direct product term, the action of x on beta, and then you have another term. Yeah? And so you can interpret this as being this is hemi semi direct product. And this other term is kind of the co-cycle term. Yeah. So you can describe the Courant, the, the Dorfman bracket of the Courant algebra as being almost a hemi-semi-direct product up to some co-cycle term. Yeah. And uh, just to uh, yeah, it, it, this was kind of the, the starting point of uh, one of our works with uh, Camille Laurent Jean Gould, where we integrated Courant algebra yeah, from this Leibniz point of view. Yeah, you can always say the hemi semi direct product, you can integrate very easily. And so ev it, everything boiled down to integrating the cosine. So this was joint work with Camille. Okay, this is just to have some some examples on the blackboard. Now, uh, maybe you have questions. Please interrupt me if you have questions. Is it readable what I say and understandable? Yeah. Oh. Thank you for replying. Okay, now the next topic, which is also um, kind of involved, is what what is the correct structure of modules for a Leibniz algebra? Yeah? I already told you what a, a module over a lead algebra is, what a G module is. Yeah, we, we had it on the blackboard. So um, one might naively guess that uh, we just take a morphism 
or Leibniz algebras from the Leibniz algebra into the endomorphisms of a vector space. Yeah, but this does not give anything interesting because uh, <clears throat> the endomorphisms of M are a Lie algebra. Yeah, and so when you consider a morphism like this, let's say a whole, uh, then the Leibniz ideal will always act trivially. Yeah, and so these are just the H Lie modules. Yeah, and so this is kind of it is a, a, a possibility to consider uh, modules for Leibniz algebra, but this is kind of not the whole story. Yeah, it's only how instead actually it's kind of the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, so the correct definition is. In terms of bi modules. Yeah, uh, meaning there is a, is a left and right operation. Yeah, and, and this is kind of very clear why this pops up because uh, you can, when you consider a Leibniz algebra, yeah, the uh, the bracketing uh, with elements from the left or from the right is not the same. Yeah, uh, and it does not just uh, differ by a sign. It's not the opposite. Yeah, uh, this is the case for Lie algebras, but not for Leibniz algebra. So it is kind of very natural to to consider separate left and right operations yeah and so this is why we will always deal with bi modules yeah? and now what should these left and right operations uh, satisfy yeah and so uh, in order to understand what these two operations satisfy yeah um in order to understand this just write down what is the leibniz identity uh, on the vector space uh, m plus h yeah leibniz identity on M plus H, yeah? Yeah, and if you write down this Leibniz identity, you interpret bracketing of X with M, yeah, from the left-hand side as this left operation, from the right-hand side as this right operation, yeah? Okay, then write this, the, Leibniz identity is M plus X prime. Second, second plus M prime plus M X. Yeah, this is the Leibniz identity. And now from this, you can now extract the laws you want to impose on these left and right operation by just extracting special cases. Yeah. By the way, this is sometimes this manner of defining modules is sometimes called back. Okay, so what do we get if we have two elements in H and one element in M? Yeah, then this gives uh, X uh, uh, <clears throat> X prime plus 
yeah, and we wanted to write the bracket if x goes on the module element by a dot, yeah, it's it's an operation. So this is the left hand side, just written with operations in terms of the bracket. And on the right hand side, we have now we consider here m equal to m prime equal to zero and x uh, second prime equal to zero. Yeah, so this gives um, uh, x, x prime dot and second plus <coughs> here it's x prime dot x dot and second. Yeah, and so this is kind of the same as uh, yeah h module or h v module from next this is the same as the, the module structure in the least sense which i described before now uh, we have two more uh, identities to impose on uh, M to be a H I module. The second one is when I take <coughs> uh, the module element in the middle. So this gives M X dot M prime dot X second is equal to uh, X uh, dot M prime. Second plus M dot second. Yeah, so it, this tells you how a bracket acts on the right in this right operation. Yeah. And you have a third one which comes when the module element is all to the left. Yeah. Then this gives same thing here gives um, m x second is equal to m x plus m second. So. Uh, when we have these laws, yeah, now you can you can rewrite them, uh, yeah. yeah, you can forget that where these came from and call all the m's m, yeah, and call the this one x prime, no, not this one, this one x prime, yeah. And uh, here, x, x prime, x, x prime, uh, x, x prime. Yeah, and then you erase this one, and you have the axioms of being uh, an H by module. And H by module. If these three laws are satisfied. Yeah? And so the first example of <coughs> the bi module is then, of course, if H is an H bi module for uh, yeah, left operation bracket from left. And right operation yeah. and this is clear yeah here you don't have to show anything because all these three laws came from the left Leibniz identity yeah so by the left Leibniz identity for the bracket these laws these three uh, laws are satisfied. okay now uh, 
what is interesting to note is that in, yeah, so kind of we understand the first identity. This is just the left uh, module structure. What about these two second and third identities? Yeah, here you can note that uh, yeah, this term here yeah, is the same as this term here. And <clears throat> this term here is the same as this term here. So when you add, yeah, when you add both equations, then this appears on the left and on the right hand side. So you can cancel it. So from L M L N M L L, you can uh, deduce that zero zero is equal to M of X dot M dot X prime plus M dot X dot X prime being X dot M plus M dot X dot X prime. Yeah. What? H or M and M. So what does this mean? This means that this means that uh, the right operation It's zero or trivial on the sub module on the sub I module generated by X dot M plus M dot X or X X H or And so, uh, they, actually, there are two special cases. Yeah, if the left operation equals the opposite of the right operation, then call this the symmetric. And if a right operation is zero, then call it an anti symmetric H binary. And so, uh, actually. Uh, when yeah, given a left module, H module, in the sense of LLM, yeah, then get the symmetric. H by module by putting M dot X equal to minus X dot M and an anti symmetric by module. By setting M plus X equal to zero. Yeah. These are two ways of, of getting a, a by module out of a just left module. Yeah. Either you put the right operation equal to zero or you put it equal to minus left operation. And 
So I will finish then by um, the following things. Um, yeah, for any H by module M, there is an anti symmetric by module M zero, and M zero is generated by the X M plus M. X. This is what we just saw here. X and H and M and M. Yeah. The quotient quotient by module M over M zero is what we call M sim is symmetric. Why is it symmetric? Because we just quotiented by the things, yeah? If, if, if this expression is zero, this means that the left operation is equal to minus the right operation, yeah? And so in the quotient, yeah, it, be, uh, it becomes symmetric. So we have a short exact sequence. Any bimodule, which is zero goes to M zero goes to M goes to M sim to zero. And in the example we just had, uh, H with N joint by module structure, yeah. The ideal of squares, H itself and H leap. Yeah. And so this is an exact sequence, not only as H by modules, but it is in fact also an exact sequence as Leibniz algebras. Okay. So then. This is kind of a natural place to, to stop. So maybe you have questions. Is the right derivation equal to left derivation at any point or instance? Um, uh, so from the abstract point of view, uh, from the outset, there's no link. Uh, between left and right <laughs> operation. I call them operation, yeah? When you have a bimodule, you have an operation from the left and an operation from the right. And these two have nothing to do with each other, unless, yeah, or, uh, but you have these three laws, yeah? L, L, M, L, M, L, and M, L, L, yeah? But, uh, from the outset, nothing else. But in some special cases, they can be derivations. Yeah, in in some special cases, they, uh, one of them can be equal to minus the other. Yeah, so it's not equal to. Uh, usually, right derivation is not equal to left derivation, but but to minus left derivation. Yeah, there is a sign usually in some special. Cases. Yeah, does this answer your question? What algebraic information we get from cohomology? Oh yeah, thank you for this question because this is exactly what I'm going to talk about uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. So tomorrow we will talk about Lie algebra cohomology and I will have um, the, the interpretations of H0, H1, and H2 on the blackboard. And, and uh, so um, the story, uh, actually the story is kind of very similar for Lie algebras and for Leibniz algebras. So I will only tell them for Lie algebras. Yeah? And uh, 
because uh, otherwise I would not have the time to, to finish what I want to say. Are we dealing with continuous cosines, like in general lead cohomology theory? Yeah, actually, um, in here in these lectures, I will be only uh, dealing with finite dimensional lead algebras and finite di finite dimensional Leibniz algebras. So no continuity here, but. Uh, in, in some special in, uh, cases and uh, uh, these continuity questions can be very interesting. Yeah, and uh, I, I encourage you to, to think about these. Maybe more questions or shall we stop here? Hello. One more, please. Okay. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, well, can you repeat your explanation about the link between uh, differential geometry and uh, Leibniz algebra, please? Okay. I actually th there there are there are many links. Yeah, and uh, I can only talk about some of them, but. Uh, actually, if if uh, if this goes together with your question, with the question of your colleague about continuous co-cycles, yeah, then you can look at a paper of Jerry Lauder in 1993 uh, about, um, maybe I cited it here. Uh, yeah, Leibniz cohomology for differentiable manifolds. Yeah, it is in 1990. I'm sorry. It is on the uh, reference list. Yes. Yeah? So, so there's another link with, uh, to differential geometry. But what I talk, talk, talked about was, um, uh, yeah, the derived bracket formalism. So this is different. And this goes when you have a diff differential graded Lie algebra, DG Lie, yeah? Then get a Leibniz algebra by the derived bracket operation. Yeah, and so in differential geometry, you have very often uh, differential graded Lie algebras, yeah? For example, the differential forms on a manifold tensored with some finite dimensional Lie algebra, yeah. yeah, they give you a differential graded Lie algebra, for example, or uh, the Scouten Lie uh, graded Lie algebra gives you a differential graded Lie algebra with zero differential. Yeah, okay, then this is not very interesting. But yeah, it, so uh, you have differential graded Lie algebras in, in several places in differential geometry. And the other thing I was talking about was courant algebraids. Uh, maybe I should stop here in order to, to, to have Anna Agor talk right now. Thank you. Thank you for your interest and see you tomorrow. Yeah, thank you all, um, and thanks, Professor. Um, I'm gonna for his awesome, awesome talk.